for Con. Reminder, Go for Con is back on this year. Uh, and we're still looking for, uh, we're, we're still in the early stages of planning Go for Con. Uh, we'll be looking for volunteers. If you want to volunteer, Go for Con, I mean, I guess you want to volunteer. Uh, if you want to volunteer for Go for Con or want to help us with running the, this stuff, just come find us. Yeah, come on, Cool. Okay, I'll let you take over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Great. Cool. Yeah. So I hope you can all hear me okay. If you can't, just let me know. I can speak up at any point or if I have to zoom in on something because you can't see it, just let me know right away. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to start things off. I'm going to be talking about mocking in Go with the Testify and Mockery Library. So, short introduction about myself. My name is Miriam. I'm a software developer at Digio. Um, my path to software development is something you'll hear more and more these days. I'm a self-taught programmer. I learned how to program using Python in 2020, and then was lucky enough to get uh, taken as a trainee at Digio in 2021. And that was the first time I started working with Go on a project, and I've been working with it ever since. So it's been one and a half years of a whirlwind romance, and so I need to share the love. What I'm gonna be talking about today, so that's mocking, but um, the goal that I set for myself was that no matter where you are in your journey with Go, you'll have something you'll be able to take away with you today. So we're going to be starting at the basics, and I'm going to quickly touch on why do we mock, how does it work, just so everyone's up to speed. Then we're going to look at manual mocking, which might be the go-to move for some of you, and maybe others of you have never tried it, so I'm going to touch on that. Then I'm going to introduce the library, Testify and Mockery. And then we're going to go right into a live demo, and I'll be showing you how you can uplift your code so you can start introducing mocking and use them in your table tests. Um, and I'll also be touching on some like more advanced ways you can use the Testify library. Then I'll be comparing Testify Mockery versus GoMock, which is the other very popular mocking library out there. And then we'll have a quick look into the future. So yeah, why am I talking about GoMock as well? Well, that's because I've actually only worked with GoMock so far. I've always been working with GoMock and it was the go-to library for me. The main reason being that when I first checked uh, out Testify and Mockery way back when, it had like this one weird thing about it that made it so much more annoying to use, in my opinion. And so I never looked back at it. GoMock was the go-to thing. Um, but then I started making this whole presentation and I made it for GoMock, actually. And then at some point I was like, I should also look at other libraries out there just to give you a comparison. And I looked at Testify Mockery and I realized that they've been publishing a lot of updates. And Mockery, re Mockery recently had an update that actually in my opinion, puts it far above where GoMock is these days. And I'm so convinced of that that I went back and I rewrote the entire presentation <laughs> to instead show you Testify and Mockery and show you why I think in nine of 10 cases, it's the better one to choose. Cool, so let's get started. Yes, like I said, let's first talk about why do we mock? So let's read a quick description. Mocking is to isolate the behavior of the component being tested. So we need to simulate, AKA mock, the behavior of its dependencies. A lot of words, let's look at something visual. So that's um, the repository we'll be working with today in my live demo. It's a very simple um, approach to just saying like it's a booking API. We have the API layer, which has a new booking handler that then calls the booking layer, which creates the booking functionality. And that then calls the payment layer, which processes the payment. So simple setup. We wanna focus on unit testing the booking layer. That's what we care about. So unit testing is all about testing a small component. And we want to be in full control of anything that component is being handed, be it from what it's call calling it or whatever its downstream services are. And we want to be in full control so we can make sure that the booking layer in that case handles each case the way we want it to. What that means for our unit test is that we don't care about the API layer because we're calling the booking layer and we're passing to it the parameters we care about. And the other thing it means is that we're going to be replacing the payment layer with a mocked payment layer where we are in control of what it returns so we can make sure it's doing whatever we need it to do. Cool. So that's what mocking is all about. So let's have a look at manual mocking. Manual mocking or mocking in general starts with an interface, right? You can't mock abstract, you have to mock a interface functionality. So here we have an interface of type payer and it has one function. It's called process payment takes a payment, returns a payment state and an error. If I want to manually mock that in like the most simplistic way, 
I would create a mock payment service, for example, here with two fields, the payment state and the error. And that mock payment state implements the payer interface because it calls the function that is part of that interface. So it calls process payment, looks exactly the same as above, but I am telling it what to return, right? So here I set the payment state and error, and here that's what I'm returning. So when you see manual mocks, they'll probably be a lot more complicated than that. You can do a lot more. For example, you can assert that whatever is being passed in is exactly how you need it to be. And often you'll see them set up to like also take functions and then execute the function that you defined beforehand. So it can get quite complicated. And that leads me right away to why should we use it? Well, there's two big pros. It gives you a lot of control and a lot of flexibility. So you can, you can make your mocks to be exactly what you need them to be for each test case that you're testing. So if you're testing something really complex, you can set them up to do this really complex thing so you can be exactly sure that your component is doing what you need it to do. However, I personally think there's a lot more cons to using them. The first one is that development and maintenance is time consuming. Development kind of depends on how comfortable you are with Go and the concept of mocking. As someone who is still uh, new to this whole thing, um, you know, a year ago, I wouldn't have really known what mocking is all about um, and how to set up unit tests and how to in differentiate integration tests. So to do A, use the concept of mocking and then B, write a function and mock a manual mock that like, executes functions in it and as parameter takes a function and then maybe does like an equal shenanigans. It's just, it requires a lot of knowledge. So for people who are maybe newer to your project or to go, it might be hard to set it up or to understand it. Um, maintenance, however, is time consuming for everyone. It doesn't matter how good you are, because the fact is that your mock needs to implement the interface. So every time you change the interface, which you will be doing because projects evolve and you need more and more things for it to be able to do, you're not going to have to actually implement your code, but also, uh, sorry, update your code. You're also going to have to update your mocks. And that's just time you could be spending better elsewhere. The second thing is that there's just an inconsistency. Of course, there's an inconsistency between devs. Every dev is going to set up their mocks differently. And then also between tests even, because if you're trying to set up the perfect mock dependency for every test case, they're going to differ. And if you were there last month when my colleague Roman was talking about unit testing, or not, sorry, table testing, he and I shared a strong opinion that tests should be as um, heterogeneous as you can have them be because it makes it easier for other people to understand what's going on. When someone else is on your project and they're you know, onboarding or, or you're just going back six months later trying to understand what you did, you don't wanna spend time reading the code, understanding the business logic, and then on top of that, reading the tests and understanding what the tests are doing and then going to the mocks and then being like, what are the mocks actually doing? It's just a lot of time that's being wasted. And if the tests are heterogeneous, then you just know what's going on with one view, right? And if the mocks are generated, you don't even have to look at them because they're always the same. And the next thing is it's only as good as you make it. Like I showed you before, the manual mock I made, it wasn't validating the input. It wasn't doing anything fancy. So if you have a lot of knowledge, a lot of time, they're going to be really good. But if you don't really know what you're doing or you don't have time, they might not do as much as you need them to do. And finally, unexpected bugs. Bugs show up everywhere. If you write your own mocks, you might be trying to debug your code and looking everywhere, looking in your tests, and actually the bug is hiding in the mocks. That would be really annoying. Maybe that's time we can save. So with all of that said, may I present testify? What is it and why do we love it? I love it. I hope you will too by the end of this presentation. So testify provides a set of tools for making testing simpler, quicker, and easier, easily debuggable for easy to read test failure descriptions. Okay, so that's from the GitHub page, obviously. Um, but they have like four main packages that we care about. The first one is the assert package. It's very likely that you've seen that before. It's very popular. It's used a lot to just improve your tests, especially the output of your tests when they're failing. The assert package makes the failed tests much more easily readable. The require package is the same way. It just instantly fails your test. It doesn't like keep going when something goes wrong or unexpected, we should say. Then there's the suit package. I personally haven't used it, but from what I understand, it's like very popular for people who like a more object-oriented way to testing things. So it does like a suit, test suit setup and then a test teardown at the end. That's kind of what it's useful for. And the last one is the mock package, which is the one we care about today and we'll be talking about. So why do I keep saying Testify mockery? Well, that's actually because that's two different libraries. Testify is this library, 
Mockery is another one which auto generates the mocks for you. And they are usually set in one breath because Mockery was created to integrate with Testify. You could be using Testify's mock package with your own written mocks, but you know, you could also just generate them with Mockery. So that's what we'll be doing. So why use it? I've already touched on some of those. Um, so it's integrated with the Go testing framework. It's a big plus. Uh, it has a very simple API, both of them, especially since version 2.10, which is the one I care about so much. So that's what I'll be showing you. It has a quick setup and auto generated mocks means easy creation, easy maintainability. Every time your API changes, you just regenerate the mocks. Then there are cons, as was with anything and with any library you're using, there's a learning curve. You got to read documentation, you got to figure out what's going on. It ties into um, fine tuning only if it's possible to a certain degree. If you're auto generating your code, it'll be able to do whatever the library like has set it up to do. So if you need to test something really complex, then maybe it's not the right tool for you. Um, for example, if you started working with like GoFunk and then needed to do some shenanigans with that, it might be a bit hard to mock that well. Um, and then complex cases require in-depth knowledge of the library. Um, part of that is that just the documentation out there is really not that good, which is kind of also what inspired me to give this talk. So I'm hoping that I did all the reading and now you won't have to. So there is some documentation, but often it's not done with table tests for some reason, and it just doesn't really go into much detail on what you can do out there. So on my current project, there were a few cases where I could not figure out how to mock this one special case I needed to test and I had to go and write manual mocks. So that's just a downside of that. But the good news here is I figured out how to do it in Testify. So I will show you how you can do it in the future. Okay, so we're already at the live demo. So please give a quick prayer. I'm just gonna set everything up in the meantime. Hmm? Go hide. Okay. Cool. Okay, let's give it a second. So, um, let me see in more. Can everyone read that? It will stop being read in a second. Yeah, everyone good? Perfect. Okay, I'll give you a quick walkthrough of what's happening there. It's very naive, very simple. Basically, this is the booking service I was introducing in the beginning. It has a function, oh, sorry, it has a field called payment service. So that's the payment service we'll be calling. It has a function called create booking, which takes the booking, then it validates that booking. And once it's validated, it creates a payload. It passes that payload to the process payment, which is you know, tied to our field here. And then it handles any errors that might be coming back. And it says, you know, if the payment wasn't successful, we'll also handle that as an error. Okay, so that's a very simple setup. If we look at the payment service, uh, yes, so payment service has an HTTP client and then it has a process payment function that we don't need because we'll be mocking it. So just imagine a bunch of cool code happening there. Don't need to worry about it. That's what it looks like. Okay. So does that make sense? Yep. Cool. Then let's start the coding. What do we need to do? We need to mock out this thing for our unit tests. That's what we need to do. So the first thing we'll need to do is mock out the payment service. Now, here's step one. We can't mock out a type. This might be obvious, but for me, it was a revelation. This type we cannot mock. We can mock APIs. So the first thing we need to do is wrap this in an API. So let me get my cheat sheet so I don't have to do too much typing. Now we have an interface, payer interface, process payment, and as you can see, Golden allows you to see who's implementing it. Easy peasy. <laughs> now that we have that, we have to actually use the payer interface. So instead of using the struct that we were using before, we use payer interface here. And now we'll be able to, instead of using the payment service struct, our mocked payment service struct, as long as it implements this API, that's what's being called here. So that's the whole magic of how it works. Let's generate our mocks. So first I'm gonna show you how the basics are of how it's done. So here we have go generate mockery name pair. So I'll break it down for a second. This here basically allows us that anytime 
we use in the terminal, go generate, and then the recursive. It'll go through all the files, it'll pick up on anything that's called go generate here, and it'll generate, like it, it'll execute whatever the command is on the right. Mockery here is the package we're using to generate the mocks. And then here, name pair. Mockery does a lot of heavy lifting for us. It'll like find out where it is, and then it'll look in that file for that interface. Here's the pair interface, so it'll know that's what I need to mock. Okay, so this is probably how you've seen it before. But there's actually a different way you can do this, which I want to show you. And that's it. So it looks nearly identical, but the difference is that instead of calling mockery like that, we're actually passing to it the path to um, where it lives, so the GitHub page. And more importantly, we're tying it to a version. And so this is really what you want to do. I mean, the top one is generally what you'll see, but the bottom one allows you that no matter who starts using your code, will be generating the same kind of mocks and the same kind of functionality that you were intending them to when you first started using this library and when you set up the mocks. Um, and I think that's very important, especially with how much mockery has been doing, how many updates they've been publishing. I think you're on the safe side to tie it down to that. And it also means that anyone who uses or who um, starts using and contributing to your code will not have to you know, install mockery as a tool in order to be able to call it because it just passes to it directly. And it also means that if you don't commit your mocks um, to the code upstream, your CI CD will be able to generate the mocks itself and run tests against it, which if you want to do that, that's the way to go. OK, so that's what we're going to be doing. So let's generate. We can click here. We can do the command, like I said before. Let's watch some mocks being generated. There we go. Here they are. Wonderful, we don't need to spend too much time on it. That's our nice auto-generated code. It'll allow us to mock the pair. So, now that we've done all of that, let's create some tests. Go on. And I think um, these things, other IDs too, allow me to auto-generate my tests. I do have some extra bits still I'm going to be adding. Can I ask you for Yeah, sure. Why are you generating That's a great question, and I will get to that. <laughs> That's actually my next point after this. Um, okay, so I'm just setting everything up so we don't have to worry. Because we don't want, we only want to be wor worrying about testing cases that involve our marks. Okay, so the first thing I need to do, that's my auto-generated tests. I want to change them as little as possible. But one thing I do want to do is I want to make this a lambda function that returns the pair, which means that down here I need to call it. And now we can add our first test case. Great. So here we have our first test case. It's called success. Payment was successful. We get the valid order. It's just a function I quickly put at the bottom. And then here's the bit we care about, the bit that actually sets up our mock. So the first thing we do is we create the mock new payer. And then we tell it on process payment. So on the function process payment, get the valid payload. That's the function I set up on the bottom. And return payment succeeded or nil. OK. So that's kind of why I didn't like testify. I don't think this is very nice to look at. I have to put in like in a string, the name of the function that we're mocking out. And then the second parameter is actually the first parameter we're passing to it. It's just, it's not pretty to look at. I think it's a bit confusing and also typos happen all the time. I don't wanna have to type out the function name every time. So that, don't like it. Which is why I was so happy to see that there is a new tag now we can use. So let us try this again. Okay, yeah, looks exactly the same, but now we have with expected equals true. So let's generate that. Good thing here is we can just generate it. We don't need to delete anything. It will just overwrite our mocks. Once that's done, it's done. Okay. Yes, we're happy. Okay, now we can go back here. So this will still work. I should probably demonstrate that. Great, still works, nothing has changed. But I can do something better now. So instead of on, I call expect. And then it actually shows me the function that I want to mock. So anyone who's worked with GoMock before will be familiar with this. This is exactly what it lo looks like when you use GoMock. And now I can just give it the valid payload, Tell it to return 
my payment succeeded. And no. And it's just like before, but better. And I think that simple change alone puts the testify mockery package right above the mock because everything else it does better. That was just the one thing that was annoying. Okay. So now to get back, was it your question, Chewy? Yeah. Yes. Okay. To get back to your question. So normally, it depends. With GoMock, it's a bit different. But with mockery, if you don't specify where you want the mocks to go, it will automatically assume that you, it wants, you want them like in the same directory as your interface lives, just in a subfolder called mocks. However, you can specify where you want it to go. For example, I could just tell it, no, the output is actually one up and then make a new folder called mocks. And we can generate that. And there we go. Now it's over here. Okay, why would we want to do that? I think there's just different philosophies about where your mocks should go. So quite common, I think the most common approach is to have the mocks um, package where your interface lives, just to kind of have it like visually in the same domain. And I think that works as well. I think that's why it's the default behavior because it's the most common. However, I've worked with a few people before who maybe like Chewy prefer everything to be like in one central package for the entire service. And then that way, all the mocks are there. You can like exclude it more easily from test coverage, for example, um, or you have an easier time accessing it. So I think it's about kind of about trade-offs and whatever you prefer. Um, I personally will keep it where it was. Okay. Great. Okay. And that's about it. Um, so other things we can do, how do we use it? We can add another test case. And for example, do an error test case here. And so payment was not successful. So for example, I could say return failed, which in our case, our code will see as an error. And then as you can see, quite simple to add another test case. You can also say, give me an error back. It will also be handled as an error. Easy peasy, very easy to use, very easy to read. And with that being said, I'm going to show you some more advanced things you can do, but I'm not going to live code them. So I made something called complex booking. It is terrible and gross. It should not exist, but it allows me to show you a bunch of more advanced use cases of the library. So let's look at that. Um, success, payment initiated. So we do another one. Let's call our mark function twice. So an easy way to do that is you can just call twice here. You can also call times and do it this way. And just specify how many times you want it to be called. If it's called any more or less times than that, uh, they're going to chuck a hissy fit. So that's a good one. Um, another thing you could do here, success payment fails. So we do once and then another payment. So as you can so see, we're calling process payment twice and we're calling refund payment once. The thing here is our code actually calls process payment, then refund payment, then process payment again. But as you can see, I didn't have to set it up that way because mockery does not care about order. As long as they do get called, we're good. Cancel all case. There we go. We're good. So that's kind of important. That's a really important thing to know. If you need want to assert the order it's being called in, you're gonna need to make sure to verify that. So this is where mockery really breaks the prettiness for me. So if you want to assert order, this is exactly the same flow, process payment, refund payment, process payment. But in order to assert order, I now have to assign it to a variable. And then I have to tell the second one, call it not before the first one. And then the last one, call it not before the second one. Yeah, not a fan. So I think that kind of breaks the whole point I was saying about, oh, you're, oops, nope. your mock should be easy to read and always look the same. This is the kind of thing where someone actually has to go and look at the end of the line and kind of see what the hell is happening here. So that's not a great one that mockery does, but you can do it if you need to. Okay, another thing you can do is you can delay when the mock function returns the value you've given it. So what I came up with was, let's call the payment service, but if you don't respond to us within five seconds, we'll error out. And so in order to mock that, I'm telling it that the refund payment should be called, uh, should return something 
after six seconds. So we should throw an error. Yeah, we want an error to happen. So let's give that a try. One, two, three, four, five, six. Cool. So that works. That's something you can do. Of course, it's going to make running your tests way slower. So maybe don't you overuse it. But you can test cases like that as well. Hey, I have two more for you to go. Ah, OK. So that's the one that I couldn't figure out with GoMock. But with Testify, it's actually quite easy. So what we want to do here, <laughs> bear with me, we're passing a pointer to an empty reason struct to the function. And we want it to update that pointer to the struct. So it's not returning it, it's just updating the pointer. So we'll still like have the new value in it. Um, so how that works is this is all what you've seen before, return nil, and then we call run. We pass it function, it takes a pointer to a payment reason, sorry. And then it adds to that um, field. It's not you, it's us. And I'm my code is actually printing it out, so we'll see that in action. We'll see it work. And there we go. It's not you, it's us. Wonderful. So that's something you can do. You can also say, run a function and then return a value. It doesn't have to be a pointer. So in this case, we're saying, we're giving it a reason struct. We want it to update it and return it to us. So as you'll see here, this time, I didn't have a return um, call. I just call update and return. So that's the function name. Run and return, takes a function and it returns a value. We add, get the message and ret we return it. And that's what we're printing. So if I run that, get the message. Cool. So that's more advanced things you can do with Testify. So let me go back into my slideshow and give you a quick recap. So the first thing we looked at was interfaces. Grab you start in an interface, use that interface in your code, and you'll be able to mock it out. The second one was use go generate with path. And um, with path meaning like that, right? Not just mockery. And with expector equals true to actually make it much more usable and user friendly. And finally, play around with the API and have some fun. There's actually a lot you can do. I'd say like most testing cases, most things you require from your mocks to do, you'll be able to do with that inter with that API. Cool. So quick recap, a uh, quick rundown of testify mockery versus go mock. So when it comes to mocks generation, are both pretty straightforward. Um, so you both have to go generate, you have where you tie to. And then the big thing with GoMock is that it's been out for quite a while. Um, and there's like this bug now because modules have become mandatory in Go that it isn't able to generate mocks. And if you're in that position, you're going to be Googling like crazy, trying to figure it out and find some GitHub thread somewhere where someone solved it for you. So I did that. Um, here you go. This is the solution. You just need to add this flag, then it'll generate just fine. So that's just a heads up for you. Then we have to test setup. Um, test setup is pretty much the same. So once we have the with expect a flag, as you can see, it's like the same thing, basically. Both very straightforward. Then a certain order. So this is really where I think GoMock shines compared to Testify. With Testify, we have this annoying one, not before, not before. Looks really ugly. I went over that. GoMock has in order. And look at that. They're in order. So easy to read. Absolutely great. They've had it for a very long time. Mockery only brought in this not before, not too long ago, or testify in that case. And like the after was already taken, and so it's not before, and we'll just do it this way. So I'd say if your project, you need to mock out a lot of things where the order that your de uh, dependency is being called is really important. If that's a thing, that's when go mock is going to be the library that you want. But if that's not really a thing you care about too much, then testify works just fine. And here's the main thing that really um, Testify brings in, which is that the test failure output is so much easier to read. So for example, here we have the same useless feedback message that actually comes from my code right now, very hard to understand, but it's nicely formatted. It's a little easier to find. That's something, it saves you some time. But when it comes to other issues, like for example, unexpected function call, GoMock hides it somewhere there, here we go, Here's the unexpected call, and then you need to figure out what's happening. Well, in Mockery Testify, it's nicely formatted, and it really explains what the problem is. It says, hey, I don't know what to return because this method call was unexpected. 
Thank you for putting it in human language. Oh, did I something? Oh, yeah. Um, and returns values when they're set up wrong. Go mock. So confusing. So confusing when you set that up wrong. But with testify, it can't even happen. It won't even let you do that, that mistake. So you can't set up your tests wrong. Or you're less likely to stumble into setting up your tests wrong with testify, which I really appreciate. Cool. Then when it comes to popularity and regularity of updates, so testify and um, GoMock both have not been updated since 2021. But um, the mock package, which is the one that generates the mocks, that one gets updates like all the time. And that's where this nice flag came from. And there's also a few cool things happening in the future that I'll touch on in a second. When it comes to documentation, I think they're both, they both suck. Um, then I think Mockery has like a little better documentation. If you look at what vector, Mockery shows some cool things. It puts it in language you can understand. It makes you excited for the future. But both of them really don't have much out there, and especially not with table testing. Um, yeah. And that's the look into the future to get you excited about using Mockery and Testify. So Mockery is talking about bringing in three big innovations. The first one is they want to do a package-based model, which means they'll load the entire package at once instead of doing it file by file, and that'll reduce much the runtime and it'll simplify the logic. They want to improve the error reportings to update to modern Golang practices. And they want to try configuration-driven gener generation, which means that you can put everything into like a central YAML file specified for all your mocks, and then all your mocks will be using that configuration right there. Not only will that make it simpler for you to update how you're using it, but also it'll become like more uh, quicker, it'll use less time because it'll be able to see all of your config set up there and it won't have to do as many smarts as it's trying to do for you right now, which might be nicer because you have to type less in the beginning, but then every time it generates, it takes longer. Yeah, and with Testify, oh, and with how long far it's along, so they have like a Trello board, you can kind of see what they're working on and they have a bunch of things in the to-do column, they have a bunch of things in the done column, Nothing's really in the progress column, but they do bring out updates all the time. So I think we're going to be seeing this at some point soon. When it comes to Testify, like I said, it hasn't been moving much, but I did find an interview with the, with the creators, and they are saying they're working on version 2. They're not really saying what it'll be about, but they're saying it'll be a tighter API, and they'll focus on improving core functionality. And they actually have a survey on the GitHub page. So if you want to go there and kind of give them some feedback about how you can use it Testify, any of the packages, then you might have your voice heard in whatever they're doing over there. Cool. And with all of that, thank you. And let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Of course, yes. <laughs> sure. Does everyone want to hear about that, or do you want to look at it? Oh, the, sure, sure. Um, the run and return function was the question. You want me to elaborate on it? What do you want me to elaborate? Like how it works? Oh, okay. So um, it works like the run one above, which means that we're setting up a function and it'll then execute the function in the mock. So you're you're setting it up to do whatever you want it to do and then probably update some values. I mean, the main reason I would be using this one is really if I'm passing in it a pointer. And I want you to do something to that pointer. So that's not uncommon. For example, if you want on Marshall JSON, often you pass in what you want it to Marshall into, and it'll update that pointer. Or if you work with a database, some of them, you know, want you to pass it to struct and then it fill up the, fills out the fields, but it doesn't give it back to you. So that's the kind of thing you could mock with that one. So that's where what I was using it for when I couldn't use Go mock for it. And so run and return is the same thing. You pass it a function, but the function can return something. So same concept, you tell it to execute something and then to return a value of some sort, whatever you want it to be. Yes, it replaces the return. Yes, it does. Does that make more sense? Yeah, cool. OK. Yes. With the order dependent stuff, Yeah, <laughs> I would absolutely agree with that. 
Um, I think just because they didn't have it from the beginning would be my assumption. Like I found the actual GitHub thread where people were requesting and being like, it would be really good to assert order. And they were like, oh, it would it? But after it's taken. Uh, I've introduced it not before. It won't break anything. Just use that. So maybe that's why like it's just it would require a rewrite of how things work. Uh, sound out the justified and all this to see what, how um, exactly they would be if someone were to write like a GDO for your version 2, which is not yet written. How about we just do it in order? Sort of like yeah. saying those guys. I mean, I love that idea. I know I don't really know who they are or what they do. I've only found that they've interview with them. This seems a lot of fun. But I'm sure you could like raise something like that on your GitHub page, um, like as an issue. I'm sure, like, I know if I wrote a library and someone had a solution for me, I would love that. So, yeah. I mean, I can show, I can give you the link to the interview I found, maybe there are in there. Yeah. <laughs> but I agree, it would be good to have. Yeah. Well, they did try to make the argument that this is better because it allows you to like do some of them in a certain order and then the other one is like whenever and it doesn't matter but gomo can do the same thing you just do an order and then you also use after so i and then you just put one on the end you don't worry so yeah i think just haven't gotten around to it i hope i hope they'll get around to it cool any other questions no i'm also happy to chat afterwards if you want to see it a bit more slower how to do mocking and table test generation whatever I think this is an important subject, and I'm happy to show you some more. On the topic of table tests, um, table testing, Roman gave a talk last um, hmm. so it's on YouTube, you can go check it out. And it's really good. Yeah. Oh. I saw the table test, and I'm going to pull it out. Anyway. <laughs> uh, thank you. Good? Yeah. Well, we're going to have a quick uh, break, toilet. So uh, that way, men's toilets and women's toilets are that way. Um, and we'll be back in five minutes, ten minutes um, for next talk. Sorry, guys. Oh, we didn't lose anything. <laughs> Sorry guys. Sorry guys. Can we see the Yeah, no, no, it's all good. It's check it all. It's been through a few versions, yeah. Um uh, and we're going back to here again. You know, there was some funny stuff at the beginning. Which is quite good. Sharing again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to take you to place some other floor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So let's start that again, shall we? Uh, I was going to start by saying that Miriam has managed to completely debunk my entire speech by giving me something interesting to go back. <laughs> and do at the office uh, when I when I go back. So uh, thanks for that, Mary. I'll talk to you about it afterwards. Um, I my talk, as you have been warned, is I love Go because it is so boring. 
just before I get started, I would like to uh, take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we're meeting and pay respect to our traditional owners and to the traditional owners of this land, the Gadigal people. I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. I would also acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded, that it was, is, and always will be Aboriginal land. I would also like to state my personal support for the voice of Parliament and the enshrining of it in the Constitution. Talk. Right, so, I've already been introduced. My name is Nicholas Gledhill. I currently work as lead engineer for the content discovery team at the ABC uh, with Cashy, who's sitting here in the audience tonight, developing the platforms that algorithmically surface the content that we believe you would like to see when you meet the ABC. <laughs> I'm here with you tonight to talk about something really boring. Oh, no, sorry. What I meant to say was I'm here with you tonight to talk about how boring the ODC's use of GOAT is. No, sorry. Um, I know, let's try that again. What I meant to say was I'm here with you tonight to talk about how boring my job is. No, sorry. Let me start again. Um, I'm sure that most of you have heard this before. Just in case you can, I'll go and stop me if you get bored. Larry Wall, linguist, programmer, author, inventor of the Perl programming language, and most importantly, winner of the international obfuscated C code contest twice, <laughs> once said that there are three virtues that define a great program. Those three qualities are laziness, impatience, and hubris, and laziness. Laziness is the quality that makes you go to great effort to reduce overall energy expenditure. It makes you write labor-saving programs that other people will find useful. And it makes you document what you wrote so you don't have to answer so many silly questions about it. Impatience. Impatience is the anger you feel when the computer is being lazy. This makes you write programs that don't just react to your needs, but actually anticipate them, or at least pretend to. Hubris, excessive pride, the sort of thing that Zeus zaps you down for. Also, the quality that makes you write and maintain programs that other people won't want to say bad things about. And so, in a similar vein, I would like to posit the idea that one of the great virtues of a great programming language is being boring. But before we get to the truly boring bit, I will get there, I promise you, a little bit about the ABC and my personal history. I've been working at the ABC now for almost 17 years. I joined in 2006 and started working with a team called the XML team, a name which didn't mean anything more than <laughs> and it does now. <laughs> I won't try to explain this would be here all night. Uh, a number of years working on transformations in XSL and building publishing systems using VBScript and XSL 1.0. It can be done, I promise you. Uh, I got the opportunity to move back into real programming in Node.js before finally being given the opportunity to develop an API in Golang, the recommendations engine, a platform that I have now been working on in some way, shape, or form since around 2015. Here's a really boring top level picture of what we're actually doing, taking audience requests and returning recommendations to people, generic and personalized. And these are the more detailed pictures. Um, the trust me, absolutely none of them include anything particularly interesting in terms of Go implementation. There are other implementations of Go at the ABC. Um, they are, uh, let me get some details here, Coda, the digital archive of content. Oh, goodness, it's fancy. You can tell me about that too. Uh, the Facebook Notifier, the platform that controls the notifications you get from news on Facebook. Uh, the iView and the iView CMS, uh, where all content and content metadata for our iView catalog is stored, updated and retrieved. Uh, Metro. Uh, the video transcoder, I, was that anything to do with the stuff that you were doing? 
two. Yeah, yeah. So that's the stuff that two is working on. The video transcoder that creates different versions of our video assets for distributed publication. Uh, Seesaw, uh, not the same as the application I found on offline called Seesaw, it's an internal app called Seesaw. The platform that stores and distributes audiences, specifically chosen favorites and preferences. And Terminus, uh, the platform that allows all ABC content from many different sources to be retrieved in a common format for redistribution across the web and on mobile apps. But the parts that I work on are Disco, short for Discovery, the personalized audience experience platform and the recommendations engine, the platform that algorithmically returns a list of content recommended for someone visiting any part of the ABC on the web or a uh, ABC mobile. When I was originally asked to do this talk, I was a bit stuck for a subject or a hook or basically, as I've already outlined, anything interesting to say here about what, how we use Go with the ABC. I asked my colleague and friend, Charlie, Charlie Sass, who now does most of the heavy lifting with the Go dev for the recommendations engine. I said, what, 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 what can I say about the implementation of recommendations? You've been working on this for a while, you know, what are we gonna do? I, I, I don't know, I mean, I, just, you know, I can't get anything, but it would be interesting to a bunch of gophers who choose to come to the Sydney Go Lang meetup. And he couldn't think of anything interesting either. He said to me in his somewhat straightforward Hungarian way, we don't do anything interesting in Go. <laughs> now, if I sound a little bit like Arnie when I try to impersonate Charlie, there's possibly some good reasons for that. Um, the only vaguely interesting thing I can talk about No, let me get to that in a second, then I'll skip to slide. Uh, okay, good. Um, oh, okay, I'm just supposed to be hanging on this slide for a while, I said. I slowly realised the reason I had so little of anything to say is simply because Go is so good at what it does. We built officially three different major versions of the API over the uh, last eight years or so in that time. And of the things that make Go, all, all of the things that make GoLang Go boring, I, sorry, I mean, so good, have only got better. The most interesting problem I can pull out in somewhat recent memory is the fact that we had some recurring problems with implementing package management back in 2019 when we used DEV for our dependency management. And yeah, it was a bit of a nightmare, and I suppose interesting, therefore. But since moving to version 1.11 of Go and upgrading our dependency management to Go modules, it's become as boring as everything else. So, what do we actually do? Uh, what I work on is the recommendations API, uh, at the thing I mentioned before, Disco, short for Discovery, the internal data API, and a thing called the scoring API, which wasn't on that list before. I must talk to Nick McCarty about that tomorrow. <laughs> um, we have two main APIs, the Recommendations API and the Disco API. And all of these, uh, and, the, and the scoring API, I, I should say, generates the offline scores for recommendations for our content based on user behavior. They all use Gorilla Mutz to do their routing and open telemetry so we can draw pretty pictures of how hard the API is working. Um, and uh, we use a bunch of other libraries to make things happen, but they're really boring. I mean, they all just work. Oh, I've got a question. Um, Please. What do you use to specify your APIs? What do you mean? Sorry. Are you, are you using yeah, so the two kind of, I guess, biggest uh, one would be something like uh, test and schema uh, or um, protocol buffers? Yes. Do you use something external to actually define and specify APIs? No, no, we don't. Uh, we define everything uh, directly. Um, we are, we have, uh, oh, we do use, sorry, we do use JSON schema for the input uh, of the payload. Um, I don't know, uh, oh, and yeah, and for defining our output. Um, I don't know what else I can say about that. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's one place that go by your definition, might well be. <laughs> it's not 
Oh, no, no. Uh, yes, I think that's true. Uh, I mean, to be completely honest, the input and the output are so simple in our case, right? We're talking about uh, a tiny little payload that outlines uh, user ID and uh, user type and uh, pretty much exactly the same output to everyone through one endpoint, you know. Uh, I'm not saying there is only one endpoint called recommendations, but I mean, there is basically only one that people use. And uh, those those inputs and outputs are so simple as to be boring, and I, I really can't uh, uh, drag any interest out of the definition of them, um, if that makes sense. I, I'm, I'm really stuck at trying to say anything interesting about the tiny little payload and the completely consistent output that the recommendations does. But the point is it just works, which is great. I hope that makes sense or answered your question in some way, shape or form. Um, this is the boring stuff that we actually do. Uh, we uh, we deliver. Um, well, there are about seven to sixteen hundred new content content um, uh, new pieces of content or content updates per day. We process at big times approximately a thousand user events per second. We respond to approximately ten million individual requests for recommendations every day. We answer one point eight million search requests each day. Uh, all while maintaining an average response latency of less than 15 milliseconds and P95 response latency of less than 60 milliseconds, an average latency for personalized response of less than 40 milliseconds, and a P95 uh, for personalized responses of less than 120 milliseconds. There are some interesting challenges in there, I completely accept, but all of that is run through four API boxes on Fargate, Linux, x86-64, four virtual CPUs, eight key boxes that run go smoothly, 24 hours, seven days a week, and easily with nothing interesting to tell you about them. All of the interesting things I could tell you about, and I'm very happy to keep talking about the recommendations all night, I promise you, and there's lots of details in there, but all of the interesting things I could tell you about had nothing to do with Go. It's deployment or it's implementation. So here I am explaining how boring we are. Please don't get me wrong, okay? I'm not being negative. This is, there are so many great things about Go, right? Oop, sorry. <laughs> so building support for concurrency. Sorry? <laughs> the building support for concurrency makes it easy to write programs that efficiently use multiple CPUs. Um, the, uh, the Go routines and channels just make it so simple and you know simple and effective ways to build concurrency and communication between processes. I was just talking um, to Miriam beforehand about how we moved from uh, from Node.js uh, in terms of API building to Go, and uh, I'll thank God Go routines instead of uh, callback functions. Oh my God, uh, 2015 was a revelation, but it's been since 2015. You know, I really don't have a lot more to say about it. Uh, compilation that produces fast and efficient executables, uh, parallel garbage job and code collector that makes some great application performance. <laughs> a syntax that's uh, simple and easy to learn, great to get up and running quickly. A standard library that is so well designed that it makes it, it, uh, it, it, makes, uh, it basic to write high quality code. A lightweight, a lightweight footprint that makes it ideal for building scalable applications that can handle high traffic loads, which is exactly what we need in the recommendations engine. There's cross-platform support supporting multiple operating systems and architectures, your Linux, your Mac OS, your Windows, your ARM, your x86. We recently wanted to move our app from Linux to, uh, sorry, Linux to ARM. Did it matter? Did we need to do anything? No, we just wanted to move it. The only thing standing in our way was the ABC security resources. Did we need to change anything in the Go implementation? Absolutely not. That was the boring thing. The statically typed and well-structured nature that makes it so easy to maintain and update over time. The built-in unit testing processes that make it inexcusable not to implement, even if we still manage not to do enough unit testing in our team. Um, our behavior is definitely still inexcusable. But this is still all the boring stuff. Chewy, it was here tonight. One of our organizers, one of the organizers of this group, was once one of the members of the machine learning team. No, it wasn't the machine learning team, it was the audience team. I'm sorry, I got that wrong in my notes. 
He should have been part of the machine learning team, that's the problem. I'm sure he can attest to how interesting what we do in general is. We use a bunch of other libraries to make things happen, but they're all really boring. I mean, they all just work. I've completely stopped up the order of my pages. There we go. So um, that's going, that's, that's getting interesting. <laughs> but none of those interesting problems are, or ever have tended to be, around the implementation of Go. And that's my point. It's what makes working with Go so good. Actually, to be honest, we did some really interesting things with uh, machine learning in Go before, during, and after the time he worked at the ABC, but that's only because he was trying to do things that didn't just work out of the box. I am honestly saying the boringness I'm talking about is really good. It's all part of the simplicity and joy of implementing something in Go. It just generally works. The interesting problems are all in the areas where things don't just work. Our implementation of Elasticsearch, all the hoops we've had to jump through to make it as efficient as we need to, the algorithms we need to find the, uh, to find the right content, getting things to deploy efficiently through Bamboo. All of these are interesting problems quite often. I can come back and talk about them some other time, maybe to a different meetup group. But the Go implementation of the API layer just works. It's boring in the most delicious way. As I stated in my Google, in my in my bio, our team, in the content discovery team, our dream is to bring enlightenment to all by creating the world's first self-aware platform to deliver uh, for delivering the ABC content you want before you even know you're looking for it. But given the project of the, uh, the given the history of the project so far, I doubt the implementation of Go is going to be where the interesting parts are. That's not a bad thing. That's the greatest compliment I can give. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to take any questions about the recommendations engine, any part of the system. I'm happy to show it live uh, and the code, etc. But I promise you, I promise you now, I have nothing interesting to say about how you should go. <laughs> I can imagine many questions. Uh, I can imagine that some adding consistent technology is your biggest bottleneck. I mean, these are some pretty impressive uh, response times. What is what is the technology that you think? The biggest uh, the biggest bottleneck, the thing that we spend the most amount of time on, and I'm just taking us back into one of the uh, more interesting diagrams here. The thing that we spend the most time on uh, is Elasticsearch, which is our data store. And uh, we, uh, a number of years ago, we were using um, EMR, uh, Spark on EMR, to do the kind of offline scoring. Uh, that was also, that, that was really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Even worse for some way. Snagging on daily basis. Uh, and, and that ended up getting really, really expensive. And so we, uh, all, we uh, in, in order to make it work, we were throwing more resources at it, and um, we weren't kind of doing enough machine learning stuff with it to make it worth it. It was a bit of a chainsaw to cut by. So we ended up sort of uh, pairing all that, that back. And as I mentioned, we've just sort of recently built the version three of the API. Part of that was rebuilding the backend architecture into this purely elastic search architecture, which means that we're doing all of this offline scoring. So we're uh, taking all of this user data in at the top, we're storing it in the various indexes of the big green box there, all of your content's coming in from the left, and you're munging all of that together and calculating offline scores for things like most popular trending um, conversion, that kind of thing. We also do also viewed as an offline calculation, so that's like people who like this content also like this content kind of thing. Uh, so you can then do content similarity and that kind of thing. And um, uh, Charlie's big call, I think, was to move all of that into our own inbuilt scoring API that uh, got all the data it needed and got all the data that it needed back into Elasticsearch. So Elasticsearch is definitely the bottleneck. It's also now the most expensive part of our implementation. Of course, um, it's not as expensive as EMR was and manages to do more, 
Um, but that's where all the jiggery pokery goes. That's where all of the data is kind of pulling things apart. And, you know, hell, I can go into some really interesting details there, I'm sure. <laughs> Sorry, is that? I didn't repeat your question. But, um, Sorry, was there another question? I thought I saw a hand. Uh, yes, yes, we are. Um, we're doing that in the scoring API. Um, maybe we should be looking at your library now, Chewy. I think I don't think I haven't pushed in Charlie's direction. <laughs> <laughs> So a matrix can be broken down into two matrix of A and B with C. Uh, so you can see your A and B. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's the matrix version of what you do in factorization. You know, so you get a number and you're trying to work out what its factors are. Um, in matrix factorization, you have a matrix and you try to work out two matrices that could be multiplied together in order to get the matrix that you started with. Okay. Oh, okay, right, okay. I'll, I'll, uh, it's, um, it's in the interesting phase right now. <laughs> Fair enough. Yes? Um, do you think that the, uh, there's a similarity as to what we can use Apple computers, as opposed to say Windows is to why colors more versus yeah. I, I think that there's definitely a line to be drawn there. Sorry, the question was uh, for the microphone uh, about a line to be drawn between the similarity between Windows and Apple in terms of boringness. Um, yeah, I mean, on that basis, I guess I should be using Windows because it's far more interesting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but then, no, 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 I shouldn't be because apparently I like being bored. So that's why I use a Mac. So the reason yeah. why people use the Mac, if it's created, is there's no amount of problems. So they're, they're not enthralled by things falling over. They just want to be creative and make stuff. Exactly. Exactly. And this is exactly what I'm trying to say about Go, which is that it allows us to create things that are really stable really easily. There isn't a lot of, there aren't many hoops to jump through. There's not a lot of, in this case, interesting stuff to do. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there are lots of people doing very interesting things in Go. Um, but what we are doing is building some fairly flat APIs that get information and send them back out to users. And uh, they do that at scale, at very large numbers with very low latency, very, very easily. And that is has never been the interesting part of the project, if you see what I mean. So you mentioned that the, the interesting stuff happens in Elasticsearch. Yeah. Um, do you have any future plans to Replace the plastic surgery being so expensive. It's funny, yeah, I just was in a meeting about this today. Uh, I'll be cashing. So, yes, we are, and we've been working with Elastic Search for pretty much, in fact, we've been working with Elastic Search for longer than we've been working with Go because we were working with Elastic Search back when we were using Node. Um, so um, it, it feels like heart surgery to me to try to take out the elastic search and, and replace it. Um, but we have used it in many different ways. And obviously, yes, because it is the most expensive part of the infrastructure now, you do start to look at other solutions because you might be able to do something equivalent a, a lot more cheaply. As a follow on that, most migration, so like data migration to a database or whatever silo you're using, uh, have problems because of historical data having been migrated in a recommendations engine. I'm guessing you don't need to actually have that much historical data. You can just sort of rely on a few miles, that sort of thing. Uh, we, we used to rely on just one one month. Yeah. We used to, uh, that, was that, that was our limit. Uh, we have recently, uh, and this is part of the expansion of Elasticsearch and part of the expansion of the cost and all that kind of thing. We've recently uh, re-architected to be able to handle 13 months worth of data, um, which um, uh, therefore specifies some of the AWS implementation that we need to use because only certain boxes have got the right kind of size on them. Um, and so we have to live with certain boxes. So um we don't yet have 13 months worth of data because it hasn't been 13 months since we implemented the system but we must have about six or seven months worth of data in there now and we're aiming to fill that up with 13 months worth 
this is all partly so that we can do recommendations on uh, long-term history. So people who showed an affinity towards an event last year that is now coming around again this year, uh, you might want to be able to recommend it in a certain kind of way and all that kind of thing. So that 12 plus one, kind of 12 months plus one kind of uh, uh, gap here, I mean, uh, data story. So yeah, we will have a migration problem. It seems highly admirable what you're doing in terms of looking back at Harvard. You're making your problem worse. Oh, we are definitely making the problem bigger. I get that. Um, I, I, more uh, interesting. <laughs> more, much more interesting. That's right. Uh, it, the migration would have been boring otherwise. Um, uh, you know, uh, Charlie, as I always say, is a big fan of making the problem bigger. Uh, he loves to bite off more and, and, and look at the bigger problem. And, and uh, we also have uh, a platform that we do something called segmentation through where you segment your audience into various groups based on their previous behavior. We bought a platform for doing that, but we're actually looking at trying to build that in-house. And part of what it could do was look back over 13 months, so we had to get parity with that system as well. So that was the other driving factor for the 13 months worth of data. Interestingly, some of the platforms that we're looking at moving to um, uh, being from the ABC, I'm a little bit uh, reluctant to actually name names and advertise people. But you know, um, some of the some of the platforms that uh, we have been looking at are uh, interestingly fully hosted systems. So we would sort of offload some of the um, ops and uh, 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 self-hosting issues to them, and uh, it becomes their issue at that point, how to balance your, your CPU power with your storage and all that kind of thing. I don't know what they're using at their back end, I don't know what limitations they've got, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So that would also be a great thing for us to get rid of that kind of problem. Um, how has this, seems like it's been some success using Go after that sort of transition material. Is the boringest noticed? Is, are, are other groups in ABC seeing this and saying, maybe we can use some of that? Um, well, yeah, I mean, as I said at the, uh, 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 earlier in the talk, oh, oh, sorry, yes, I beg your pardon. Um, sorry, the question was, uh, are other areas of the ABC noticing the boringness that we're talking about, or the value of using Go and the stability and the ease of development and that kind of thing? Um, there are a number of different areas using, um, oh, no, I completely lost my, my uh, here we go. You know, as I was saying, there are like a, now a fairly long list of uh, uh, apps that are using Go specifically. It has taken off uh, among um, certain areas of the ABC. I have to explain, I guess, uh, a lot of the development teams are fairly autonomous and tend to make uh, some, and look, there are, there are now drives to move towards common tooling and uh, uh, moves to uh, you know uh, drives to move towards uh, trying to bring everyone together in terms of the languages and tools that they use. But uh, there are lots of legacy systems on in, in different languages, and there's been a history of these teams being quite autonomous and making up their own minds. Um, and in a way, I, I, I can I can applaud that. It's one of the reasons that we managed to end up on going in the first place. You know, I, I, I had a a project manager who could turn around in 2015, some four years after they released it, uh, the released Go, and kind of go, oh, you know what? I'd just like to try building Go. You know, I've heard some really good things. Do you want to give it a go? Uh, uh, but yeah, yeah, that can be cool, you know. Um, and we've never looked back. You know, like we've never, we've never thought that that was uh, a, a possibly um, a negative decision in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and I think people did notice, and I think it did kind of start to take off um, in, in that way. And, and I think a lot of people who currently use it would say very much the same thing, that if you're if what you're trying to achieve is straightforward, you know, um, that it's that it's boring in a really, really, really good way. Well, yeah. We saw that as a question there, so I'll change it a little bit. So you're talking about the last uh, search being too expensive. Mm. Is that because you think it's doing a whole lot of indexing on the crap that you don't need and then you could do something a little bit bespoke? Or are you more interested in the idea that you could get some salesperson from some certain SaaS vendor or index to not understand how to use it? Um, Sorry, is it, I, I, I'm partly distracted by the screen. Sorry, can you kind of repeat the question and we'll repeat it to the microphone? 
So you think plastic surgeons just wasting time doing a whole bunch of stuff you don't need? And that it's going to be done? Mm -hmm. And then they could be right now. Or are you just more interested in getting some software as a service vendor? To give you too much of a um, I, look, I think it's actually halfway in between it. Sorry, the question was about whether we think Elasticsearch is uh, kind of wasting its time doing things it doesn't need to do, or whether we're just interested in offloading the, uh, the effort, I suppose, and, and handing it over to software as a service vendor. We're not definitely looking at software as a service as the only solution. We're just looking around at other alternatives fairly broadly. I'm, I just mentioned that some of them might be you know, fully hosted. Uh, and, and that brings those kind of benefits, you know, where you don't need to worry about it as much anymore. I really don't think that Elasticsearch is spending its time doing stuff that it doesn't need to be doing. Uh, there's been some amazing work in my team uh, to do with the implementation of Elasticsearch, and we've managed to uh, break down the implementation of Elasticsearch into, um, just in the back of my mind, I'm wondering whether or not I've got any diagrams I can show you really quickly. Um, I've got the ABC confidence ready. No, 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 you're right. No, 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 you're right. No, no, you're right. You're right. Okay, well done. So we've, 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 we've broken the, um, we've, we've broken down the implementation of Elasticsearch into what we call groups uh, of, of, um, of nodes. So that uh, there are some nodes that are uh, doing uh, the really a uh, hot instant reply to the user kind of thing. There are some nodes that are taking in uh, the details about the, uh, the content editor, which is a much slower process and doesn't need to be nearly as responsive. Um, there's uh, some massive streams of, 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 uh, of uh, some massive kinesis streams coming into some nodes that are the user, that's the user data. Um, and yes, we want the user data to be uh, as real time as possible, but you know, if it takes a couple of minutes for somebody's most recent behavior to become part of their uh, effective behavior in terms of what we're recommending to them, that's okay too. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's all sorts of ways that we've tried to work out what, what, what's the most important, what's the least important, what's in between, and broken down the nodes into groups. And uh, we recently had the Elastic Search guys in to have a look at our implementation. Uh, and they want to use it as a case study um, because they think it's a really fascinating way of using Elasticsearch um, and, and a really good way of kind of squeezing as much blood out of that stone as we possibly can. Um, and, you know, we sat down with them the first time and they just started asking us basic questions. Have you done this? Have you done that? Oh, yeah. Worked through all of that. And then we showed them our implementation. They said, oh, oh, can we come back and get <laughs> This is really interesting. Thank you very much. You know. Uh, again, I can come back and do a talk on Elastic Search. It's just this is the only you know. So I, I actually have no idea. Yeah, okay, I'm getting I'm getting nods. So the question was, is it written in Java? <laughs> All right. Can I just make a comment on the sentiment? We use Elastic Search, and we're very happy with what it does for us. Yeah, it performs really well. Mm. Um, yeah, the, the nature of the gun is changing. So yeah, I know, look, I'm not immediately uh, convinced, as Cassie will attest in the conversation we had earlier today, I'm not immediately convinced that we can easily find a replacement. You know, I, I think. Like, uh, <laughs> I'm no SQL slash somewhat SQL. Anyway, no, it's uh, anyway. <laughs> 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 I, there's, there's some great comments of microphone. There's some great commentary coming out. I, mean, I feel like I should repeat it for the for the, uh, for the um, But uh, no, I, look, I'm not convinced that there will will be a replacement. I mean, we 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 we're using license search. We are very happy with it, and and, and and that's a very good point. And I um, I think it's just been long enough that that question is worth going out and throwing out there again. There's obviously a whole lot of effort that comes with that, as we were pointing out, um, that makes it, it's got to be significantly better and cheaper in order to make it worth it on some level. You know? Um, I, I, I would be back, like that level of customization or 
So that that kind of question to your thing is to obviously if you can prevent it from flowing, you can't do that because you can't explain what's in the market. You can't get that contact with the risk. So, ah, yeah. So, they just want some vendors product so they're going to keep their ass and they're going to go to the wrong It's actually a Charlie's not particularly worried about this. He's just happy to get in there and come make it work. I will make it work. Right now, if you go with any replacement for the last search, then in 12 months' time, you're going to have a whole bunch of people saying, Why didn't you go with like open AI? Oh, I have these conversations all the time in the MPC already. I mean, you know, I've had to have these conversations around Elasticsearch. Uh, there was something actually that before we built recommendations engine, we built uh, the location API. So this must have been back in 2013, 2014, something like that. And we built the in node on Elasticsearch. And eventually that got taken over by another team. And uh, you know, being working for years in a fairly boring kind of way. And uh, somebody took it over and decided that they were going to sort of rehash the whole thing. And they came back to me and said, why did you use Elasticsearch at that time? And kind of said, that's the stupidest decision I could have ever thought of. And then I, it, it was a location API, right? So I took them through the functionality of Elasticsearch and the inbuilt geo uh, location coding and the inbuilt calculation of locations and borders and, and uh, polygons and whether or not polygons are inside other polygons. And went, oh. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, at least you answered the graph the question and stay long enough to hear the answer, I suppose. But yeah, there's always that kind of why aren't you using the thing that I'm used to? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> little try on the Oh, I'm hoping really soon, actually. Watch this space. Um, yeah, this, uh, each can give the presentation next time. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, I might have to hold its hand, might be nervous. Um, I will, uh, I'll, 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 I'll try to build some kind of resilience into the end of character uh, so that it can stand up and do um, no, I mean, there's some really interesting stuff happening in the machine learning team uh, at, uh, at the ABC. We are already using their, uh, for example, uh, machine learning summaries of stories, uh, machine learning keywords. Um, uh, Gareth has given some great demos of uh, things that will finish sentences or even write most of the article for a journalist. We don't tend to show that to the journalists. Um, <laughs> We just show you the keywords. Yes, you know, you know, automatically generating keywords. There you go. That helps, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, and actually, there's some um, uh, there, there's some of those kind of smarts going into surfacing um, related stories for journalists as well, because it's always been their job in the past to kind of know off the top of their head or to do research to know that there were related stories. So we're using the recommendation engine. Um, to help them find related stories and then decide whether or not they should be attached to the story and that kind of thing. Not automatically yet, because they would be freaked out by that concept. And, and, and to be honest, the hit rate isn't high enough yet. But, um, you know, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the next few years in terms of being able to um, not just take over one tiny bit of the page and generate some output over here on the right hand side that you might be interested in but to take it over the whole page and uh, reshape the whole page into something that you are generically generally going to find more interesting because of what we know about you, you know. That kind of thing. And if you guys are interested in the world, I guess you can actually give a talk on Pokemon here. So it's on YouTube, check it out. Yeah. Sorry for the microphone, that was a Gareth's talk on GoFicon.au. Yeah. Something like that. Go so check it out. Google. It's hard enough to work out what you're looking for. Yes. Right. Thank you, man. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Right. And then we'll be headed to Sweden's. I think. All right. So, yeah. Thank you. And um, see you guys in Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow.
one of the examples is that Chinese zikas, may you live in interesting times? As a person actually understands Chinese, it's not so close. No, no, no. The actual phrase is uh, that it's better to be 